Oh, uh, Diddy's going down, or at least one could assume. After all, he's caused some vehicles to, you know, poof, and psychologically tormented the artist Cassie for an audience on Instagram Live. And now, well, he's going to court for some pretty unsavory stuff. And according to leaked documents, there's 10 celebrities he's taking with him. So who are these named celebrities? Let's start with Young Miami. City girls are not in Rodney, Lil Rod Jones's $30 million lawsuit against the rapper Diddy, owner and operator of Bad Boy Records. He says his life's been determinably impacted since agreeing to work on the Love album Off the Grid. One of the instances that left Jones so traumatized, he states, was that young Miami's cousin and or assistant, he's not sure, tried forcing unconsensual relations with him. Jones says he was with Diddy, young Miami, and the female cousin person on Thanksgiving in 2022. He alleges that Miami's cousin person burst into the bathroom while he was inside, at which point she tried forcefully touching him with her mouth and her hands. Jones attempted to get away only to have the woman persist him back into the main room. Young Miami is being called to court as a defendant for Diddy, but also faces questioning on the stand due to Jones's allegations as she was among those who were paid monthly fees by Diddy to work as his working girls. More on that in a bit. Cuba Gooding Jr. is an Oscar winning actor who's also being accused of harassment, an essay by Jones. Jones states in his case that he believes that Diddy was G-wording Gooding Jr. to behave in a similar manner to which Jones accuses Diddy of behaving. Eh. Get, hear my playful language? Remember, this is a brand spanking new court case. We can't assume anything, it's all alleged, so take everything with a grain of salt. Anyways, one recording incident that warrants harassment claims from Jones occurred while on a yacht in January 2023. Jones alleges he was introduced to Gooding, who proceeded to grope him and try and touch him before he had to forcibly push him away. To quote, Mr. Combs had dominion and control over the actions of Cuba Gooding Jr. and failed to step in and stop Cuba Gooding Jr. from essaying Mr. Jones. The suit says that with multiple allegations in this lawsuit, including these, screenshots are also included that claim to show the moment surrounding the alleged incidents. Diddy's own son is apparently involved. Our next segment is on Justin Combs, who thinks he's something of a rapper himself, but he really just spends his time crashing cars and spending his father's money. So, but you know what? He might have also witnessed or participated in something crucial, as Jones alleges in his case that in September of 2022, a man identified in the lawsuit only as G who was a friend of Diddy's son Justin, was popped. During the alleged incident, Jones says he heard bangs while two feet away from the restroom at the Chalice Recording Studio in Los Angeles. When Diddy and Justin exited the restroom, Jones saw G suffering from a wound on the floor of the bathroom, at which point he offered assistance. Per Jones, Diddy, quote, forced him to lie to the authorities about the event, with police being told it was the result of a drive-by. A rep for Diddy issued a statement to TMZ denying the allegations which they say are lies from a desperate person, referring to Jones. The lawsuit implicates Justin of also procuring girls for parties where Combs then actually apparently spiked people and recorded them. Ugh. Meanwhile, Stevie J is also at the center of an allegation. Bad Boys Records producer allegedly, according to Jones, was also being G-worded by Diddy, who used his quoted admiration of Stevie J as part of what Jones says was intended to leave to Stevie J's anxiety concerning homosexuality being erased. This is a uh, pretty whack. Again, reminder, all alleged, all speculation. But continuing on, Jones alleged that Diddy even once played him footage showing Stevie J like having intercourse with a guy. And Stevie J himself had to respond to this online since the news broke, telling TMZ his lawyer will be handling for this from going forward. Again, screenshots are included in the lawsuit in connection to this. And an adult film star named Knockout has been connected as well. In fact, in in reality, to stir the pot, Knockout himself addressed the leaked screenshots on Twitter, admitting it's me amid speculation. So things are heating up. Meanwhile, Prince Harry is having his awkward youth years uh, hanging with rappers pulled up by Jones, who cites that Harry in his court case, but not as a perpetrator, rather as a witness to acts done, which ultimately isn't better, especially given it's the context that there's some forms of trafficking charges the feds have laid against Diddy. According to Jones's lawsuit, first filed in February, Diddy's co-defendants were rewarded for quote participating in and facilitating Combs trafficking venture by getting affiliation and access to Mr. Combs's popularity. According to Jones, Mr. Combs was known for throwing the best parties. Affiliation with and or sponsorship of Mr. Combs trafficking parties garnered legitimacy and access to celebrities such as famous athletes, political figures, artists, musicians, and international dignitaries like British Royal Prince Harry. Oh, there's the name drop. Well, it can be argued it's kind of deeply unfair 
for Harry to be singled out by name when he has not been accused of anything wrong and others aren't named. His naming in the suit exposes how interconnected the elite of our world are and how they can truly be anywhere with anyone. Don't think there's some posh people, folks. On to another industry notable. This time it's the former Motown Records CEO, Ethiopia Habtermerium, who Jones says in his lawsuit visited Combs's house during writing sessions and social gatherings and that she, quote, had a duty and obligation to ensure working girls and girls in general were not present and that Mr. Combs was not spiking any drinks. Another staffer accused by Mr. Jones is Christina Cora. So in his lawsuit, Jones alleges he was once forced to work in Combs's bathroom. Well, Combs, did he? Showered in a naked glass enclosure, according to the lawsuit. When he raised concerns about this form of these types of behavior to Karam, Combs is chief of staff. The lawsuit says she dismissed him as friendly horseplay, stating those acts were Mr. Combs' way of showing he liked you. Jones was also told by Christina, you know, Sean will be Sean. The lawsuit accuses Corman of aiding and abetting Combs' essay of Jones and working with Combs to groom him into a male on male relationship. Jones has also listed UMG boss Lucian Grange in his lawsuit, stating that he either, quote, knew or should have known about the drinks getting spiked at parties. Specifically, Jones says that Universal sponsors and Grange attended listening parties at Combs' LA home, where Jones alleges that working girls and younger women were present and that they were getting spiked sometimes. It's no secret that Mr. Combs had specific bottles of alcohol designated for females and other bottles designated for his staff, his artists, and himself, the lawsuit claims. Grange knew or should have known that Mr. Combs was spiking attendees through laced bottles of DeLeon tequila and Ciroc vodka it adds. As a sponsor of these events, defendant Grange had a duty and obligation to ensure working girls and younger women were not present and that Mr. Combs was not spiking the alcohol. At this point, uh, with names and information still developing, maybe we should take a second and probably cover what's going on. So let's dedicate our last two points on hashing how this all started. First, we're gonna start with how Cassie blew it open. So November 16th, Diddy's ex, Cassandra Cassie Ventura, filed a federal lawsuit in New York alleging years of violence. Her graphic lawsuit included such content as SA, domestic incidents, psychological and emotional torment. Diddy even blew up Kid Cootie's car to deter him from seeing Cassie romantically. No wonder J. Cole's been riding a bike everywhere since he and Diddy fell out. Diddy did what he does best in response. He denied, 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 one for each D in his dumbass nickname. And he ensured she settled out of court with him. As Diddy always does when someone sues him, go look at his track record. But it didn't make it go away this time. On December 7th, Tiffany Red, a Grammy winning singer songwriter, published an open letter to Combs via Rolling Stone, stating despite the settlement, Cassie's claims were all true. She even detailed a party where she claimed Claims Combs separated Cassie from her and their friends for what Cassie described in her lawsuit as a arrangement where you make her perform acts with male adult workers against her will. Red's graphically detailed public letter had power, especially as she detailed other instances where even she became victim to Diddy's violence just by being in his presence, which helped lead to our next segment and final, the other accusations. Five days after Combs and Cassie settled, a former Syracuse University college student sued Combs for allegedly taking advantage of her and recording it in 1991, just before New York State's Adult Survivors Act on November 26th third deadline, a second anonymous accuser filed a lawsuit against Combs and also singer-songwriter Aaron Hall, stating they had violated she and a friend and did even show up at her house a few days later, threatening and harming the, her and the other victim to ensure they wouldn't share the story. Then comes December 6, another Jane Doe plaintiff filed a lawsuit against Combs' daddy's house recording and Bad Boy Entertainment, alleging that in 2003 she was physically violated by Combs, former Bad Boy president Harv Pierre, and another unidentified man at Combs' studio in New York City. Since this fourth accusation now, Diddy's been falling to ruins. Hulu has canned his reality show centered around his family, Combs had to step aside as the chairman role at Revolt, and the liquor company Diageo asked a judge to prevent him from appearing on the new advertisement for DeLeon. February rolled in and on the 27th, Combs was sued by producer Rodney Little Rod Jones for $30 million for SA. The producer, as we know, worked on the Love album and says he was subject to all sorts of extreme crime 
crimes in a 70 page lawsuit. And then now, March 25th, the newest update. Law enforcement officials carried out simultaneous raids of Combs' home in Los Angeles and Miami with Jane and John Doe interviews being conducted. And there's some more tea to come. Number 10. The Hypocrisy Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of the lawsuit being brought against her, it seems like all of that positivity may have just been some act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I am not a small man. In fact, I have what many people consider to be a dad bod, and eh, I'm cool with it. So I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves, but like, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shamed her team and made them feel that they were too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these allegations. Liz made several posts over the years spreading the positive body image, but now she's being called out for being a massive hypocrite, which she 100% is. That's like the government telling you not to do something when they just do it anyway. They would never do that. Right? Number 9. The Leaked Meeting One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who was a part of the lawsuit, was fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently, and Lizzo's apparent dislike of the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that she wasn't committing to her role. Initially, Davies only planned on recording the conversation for personal reasons. She has a condition that leaves her disoriented sometimes, and she wanted a backup on the off chance that she forgot what the meeting was about. After it was discovered that the audio recording existed, the dancer was promptly fired, apparently being pulled into a meeting just to get yelled at before they let her go, not even giving her a chance to speak. Lizzo, exacting her star power to simply end the career of one of her main backup dancers, is insane and is most certainly worth the lawsuit coming her way. Number 8. Her Party Lifestyle One key factor of this lawsuit being brought against Lizzo is the place in which all these accusations went down. Lizzo was at a club in Amsterdam's Red Light District when she coerced, aka forced, one of her dancers to touch a woman's bare chest, despite saying several times that it was not something that she wanted to do. Facts are, this actually isn't the first time that Lizzo has been seen living it up at the club. Over the past few years, she's been known to be a regular party girl, spending a solid amount of time between touring to have just a good time and celebrate her success. But the amount in which she has been partying, despite being such an advocate for positivity, is wild. For someone who shares this message of loving yourself, she sure likes to drink the no-no juice, not to mention throwing her money around at every chance she gets. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that night in Amsterdam probably cost them a fortune. I don't know, I've never been. Moving on. Number 7. She made the dancers eat fruit. Alright, let's get into this Amsterdam situation. According to the lawsuit, Lizzo coerced her dancers to go out with her to a nightclub in the city's red light district. And once they arrived at the club, it was brought to their intention that the club encouraged dancers to wear their birthday suits. Dancers would also perform special shows in which they would launch things from their Catapults. Nope, I don't like that one. Lizzo's team were encouraged to catch the launched items, which included various adult objects, and at one point the dancers were apparently encouraged to eat bananas that had been protruding from their fruit baskets. No, that's worse somehow. But that wasn't even the worst of it. Lizzo then told her crew to come with her to a club in Paris that was specifically filled with servers and staff wearing nothing at all. All the dancers were shocked and they were robbed of their choice to not attend. I think we can all agree being handed your food by someone in nothing but kitchen shoes sounds pretty uncomfortable. This is when Lizzo had heavily encouraged dancer Miss Davies to touch one performer on her chest, which she clearly did not want to do, but her boss yelled at her and told her to do it, so you know how that goes. Just an overall weird night and I'm not even mildly shocked that someone came forward to call this out. Shady. Number 6. The dance captain. Lizzo is not the only person being named in this lawsuit. Her dance captain, Shirlene Quigley, is also facing a slew of accusations. According to the suit, Quigley shared lewd physical fantasies with dancers and the crew and publicly discussed the purity of one performer while simultaneously berating all other dancers who had premarital relations. Now, sharing your beliefs is one thing, but trying to jam them down the throat of your employees, that's not a great move. According to several dancers from the past few years, whenever 
this woman was around, she was a nightmare. Not only spouting her religious beliefs at anyone who had ears, but also attempting to convert several of the crew members. Quigley is being named personally in this lawsuit for creating a hostile work environment, having extreme racial biases, discrimination towards disabled employees, and a failure to prevent or remedy the situation. Number five, Lizzo tried to distract us. Lizzo is just like the rest of the world. When she's had a few too many adult beverages, she's unable to keep her hands off her phone. According to a TikTok post from earlier this year though, Lizzo admitted to sliding into Captain America star Chris Evans' DMs. She had apparently sent him emojis of dashing away, women playing handball, and a basketball. Now I'm no detective, but was this supposed to be like, I'm coming to you Chris, balls in your court. Ah, who knows what she meant. But to follow up that message, she released a TikTok in which she lip synced to an audio clip. You know, that thing that makes people tons of money for doing absolutely nothing on an app. I was going to quote it, but I can't physically type things from TikTok because my brain starts to twitch. So it's my least favorite app in the world right now. And that includes Flappy Bird. The fact that she openly admitted to not only overindulging in no-no juice, but also directly suggesting that Chris's butt, his, yeah, that Chris's butt, his ball is in her net. I don't know what the emojis mean. Many fans believe she brought this to their attention to save some face when the official lawsuit was released, possibly knowing that this was coming for quite some time. Number four, her TV show. Now, Watch Out for the Big Girls is a TV show that only recently came into my life thanks to doing research for this video. The series premiered last year and follows Lizzo as she hunts for confident women to join her world tour as dancers. In fact, among the many cast members on the show were two of the three plaintiffs in this case, Ariana Davies and Crystal Williams. The show is just one of the many tactics that she seems to have used to make herself look better when the truth got revealed. Despite the show being a search for new talent, it turned into some kind of like a shield that she could use. How could Lizzo be so mean when she had a whole show dedicated to giving people jobs? Well, following the news of the suit, many people have called to question why Lizzo would work on the project when she's such an advocate for body positivity. Well, with no word from Lizzo yet as to her side of the story, the world is quickly canceling her from society and we may just end up having to add her to our top 10 destroyed careers of 2023. Number 3. The Hostile Work Environment Lizzo created an extremely hostile work environment according to the plaintiffs, with several examples that have been backed up by former dancers and even some people involved with the documentary that she was trying to get off the ground. According to the plaintiffs, Lizzo made them work ridiculous hours, including up to 12 hour rehearsal days. And one of the dancers recounted an experience of having to use the washroom and being forced to do it in her pants while rehearsing so that she didn't lose any time. Like, Lizzo, uh, if someone has to use the bathroom, let them go. Yeah, just let them go. It took longer for them to get the poor woman a new change of clothes than it would have taken her to go take five, you know? Like, next time, just let them, let them pee. Let them pee in peace. In fact, as a form of humiliation on the part of Lizzo and her dance coach, they made Davies wear a see-through garment with nothing underneath and finish her day in front of the entire crew. Now, if that is not the definition of a toxic workplace, I'm not sure what is. Number two, claimed that the dancers were drinking. Lizzo has made many claims regarding the women involved in this case, but one of the most outlandish is the idea that the backup dancers were indulging in no-no juice before every show. Lizzo claimed that the backup crew was lacking in energy, simply going with the motions and getting off the stage quickly as possible. This caused Lizzo to accuse several of the dancers on her team of party hardying before they were supposed to do their job. Jobs. Dancer Crystal Williams spoke out against the claim immediately, reminding Lizzo about the 12 hour rehearsal days and constant mental strain from working beneath her, being a contributing factor to the so called dip in energy. Trying to claim that your crew has been slacking when they have the receipts? It's a bad move on Lizzo's part and will surely be one of the several reasons that she's cancelled this year. Number one, she has said nothing. By far the shadiest thing of all and the thing taking the top spot on this list is the fact that Lizzo has said nothing about this at all, and it's not to say that she isn't aware of the suit. In fact, she posted on Instagram three separate times on the day that the news broke, but it had nothing to do with the lawsuit. Not only does that mean that she had her phone and was very capable of reading the news, but that she blatantly ignored the possibly thousands of comments and messages she is surely receiving. When something like this happens, it's important that the person being accused of the misdeeds to come forward and either fess up or deny everything. There's no in-between. Being silent is the worst thing that you can do. It gives the internet more time to circulate negative stuff, and eventually it'll take over anything good that you try to do and will land you in a realm where no one can hear your screams or cries. Now, Lizzo could very well be taking her sweet time to 
to draft up a proper statement so she doesn't actually like say something wrong that the court can use later. Makes sense because let's face it this is about to be a rough few months for this woman. I'd wish her luck but like a lot of people have backed up everything that's being said so yeah. Filling in the number 8 spot is Frozen. The now iconic Disney movie was slammed with a lawsuit after some lady tried to claim that the entire movie was written about her. Some scenes in particular matched her own personal storyline and she was quick to file a claim about it. Who watches an animated fantasy musical with talking snowmen and thinks, hey, this movie is about me? Apparently, a woman named Isabella Tanakumi. She sued Frozen for $250 million for supposedly stealing the movie from her autobiography. The movie is actually based around the old fable called The Snow Queen, which was written by Hans Christian Andersen in 1844. But that did not matter to Isabella, and it didn't stop her from suing and making a report filled with 18 different similarity points between her life story and the animated movie. Some of those similarities were that the stories are about two sisters, they both take place on snowy mountains, and both of them experience some kind of sister trauma. You can probably guess that nothing came from this ridiculous lawsuit, and it melted quicker than a snowman on a hot summer's day. See what I did there? I made a snowman joke. Like, hola. In a number six is 2001 A Space Odyssey. This lawsuit happened between two huge companies, and it was actually a movie scene that was used as evidence in the case, but then it just caused even more problems. Many years after the movie came out, you might have heard that Apple sued Samsung for copying its design of the iPad with their Samsung Galaxy tablet. Samsung put up an argument and said that they couldn't be sued for stealing the iPad design because they got the idea from somewhere else. So, who did they steal the idea from? Stanley Kubrick. In court, Samsung defended themselves with a still image from Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. In the still clip, it shows two astronauts eating and using tablet computers that look similar to iPads that Apple didn't invent until almost 30 years later. So, they claim that there is no way they could have stolen the idea from Apple and said that Apple stole the idea from the movie scene. But the lawsuit was too difficult to charge someone because tablet computers were seen in a variety of different sci-fi movies after that. The judge ended up ruling out the film as proof but did allow Samsung to use the Fiddler and Compact tablets which were invented before the iPad. Halfway through the list at number 5 is The Hobbit. Every movie scene from this movie landed in this lawsuit and two studios went face to face in the battle. The Weinstein brothers faced off against Warner Brothers in a $75 million lawsuit. Warner Brothers claimed that the Weinstein sold the rights of The Hobbit to New Line Cinema 15 years ago and only agreed to share royalty with the first film of the series. But the Weinsteins will argue that they are owed royalties from all Hobbit films because of the substantial amount that they got from the first one. They feel that because The Hobbit is only one book but is turned into multiple films, it's enough proof that they should be compensated for all of them. In their argument, they called Warner Brothers ungrateful and greedy. I mean, the first installment made over a billion dollars, so I would want in on that action too for all of them. Here we are at number four with the movie Monster in Law. Another time when someone wants to say that a movie scene replicates their own personal life experience. While watching the 2005 movie, a woman was upset to see that some of Jennifer Lopez's scenes were oddly close to her own experience. Isn't that the point? Like, aren't movies supposed to be relatable to the audience? No offense, lady, but I am sure there are a lot of people who can say that they've had a rough experience with their parents-in-law. But this woman named Sherry Gilbert believed that the movie was stealing directly from her. Apparently, she had written a screenplay about her relationship with her own mother in law back in 1998 and said that the similarities between the two are uncanny. She sued Jennifer Lopez, Jane Fonda, and others that were involved in the making of the movie. When Warner Brothers was hit with the lawsuit, they didn't even take it too seriously. How could you? Their lawyers made it clear that an annoying mother in law character was a very common concept for a film and in life. Alright, guys, we are in the third spot with a horror movie, The Cabin in the Woods. Although some people will argue if this was a horror movie or a comedy. This movie somehow ended with a 10 million dollar lawsuit after an author claimed that the movie featured things from his novel, aka Stole. Peter Gallagher wrote a book in 2006 called The Little White Trip, A Night in the Pines, and I guess it has some similarities to the film. The novel tells the story of five heroes who check out this cabin called the Brinkley House. Two of the characters' names are Jules and Dura, and the group does some drinking and flirting before they get attacked by this evil presence. But in the end, there is a plot twist, and it all turns out to be part of a reality show, which is a pretty cool plot. Alright, so there are are some similarities to the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, it tells the story of a group of students who visit a cabin in the woods and they also get attacked by an evil presence after they drink and do some weird flirting stuff. Two of the female leads
leads are named Julie and Dana, which is similar. And in the end, it's revealed that the students are part of a secret government ritual. The author sued the director, Drew Goddard, Mutant Enemy Productions, and Lionsgate for $10 million, but the judge dismissed the case in 2015. The judge's final statement was, While the two works share a similar premise, that premise is unprotectable. The concept of young people venturing off to such locations and being murdered by some evil force is common in horror films. That is a fact. Moving on to number two is Straight Outta Compton. The movie was directed by F. Gary Gray and showed the rise of the groundbreaking hip hop group NWA. If you've seen the movie, you know that the villain in the story is the manager, Jerry Heller, who was a sleazeball accused of profiting off the band and cheating them out of their own hard earned money. That's how the movie depicts his character, anyways. But naturally, these movie scenes did not sit well with the real Heller. In 2015, he filed a lawsuit against Gray, Universal, Legendary Pictures, and everyone involved in the rap group. He demanded $110 million, claiming that the movie was, I quote, littered with false statements that were meant to ridicule and lower him in the opinion of the community and to deter persons from associating or dealing with him. In June 2016, the judge allowed the case to move forward because the movie included a lot of the manager's own memoirs. The judge also pointed out that the movie implied that Heller tried to discourage Ice Cube from hiring a lawyer to review a business contract, but there was actually no evidence that it actually happened. However, the lawsuit didn't get very far because sadly, Jerry Heller passed away just a few months later. Beginning the countdown list number 10 is Rocky. The 1976 film has gone down in history for telling the story of Rocky Balboa, a small time boxer who gets the chance to fight a heavyweight champion, Apollo Creed. The screenwriter, Sylvester Stallone, was first inspired by a real life boxing match between Chuck Wepner and Muhammad Ali. It probably inspired a lot of people, which is why it's surprising to learn that he actually got sued for it. In 2003, Chuck Wepner sued Stallone, claiming that his fight scene was improperly used to promote the Rocky movies and other related products for commercial purposes. Stallone never denied the fact that he based the entire movie on Chuck's actual 1975 boxing match. However, he still sued him for $15 million, but both parties ended up settling outside of court for a disclosed sum. Stallone wanted to make it up to him by paying tribute in his sequel, Rocky II, by casting Chuck to be a boxer in it. But unfortunately, he failed the drug test and wasn't able to do it. Cruising to number eight is Pixar Animation. It all started with a lamp. You know the lamp that has been Pixar's mascot since 1986? It bounces on screen before the movie and then jumps on the letter I in Pixar? Well, the lamp is actually owned by a Norwegian lamp manufacturing company called Luxo. Throughout Pixar's years using the same lamp design, Luxo never had any issue. I mean, they probably enjoyed the free publicity. John Lasseter had even made a short film about the lamp back in 1986 called Luxo Jr. and they had no problem with it. But when Pixar started to sell a replica of their Luxo Jr. lamp character with a special Blu-ray DVD of the film up, they sued. They didn't like that Pixar was technically using their design and making sales without permission. A few months into the lawsuit, Disney and Luxo reached a settlement and the lawsuit was withdrawn. For the time being, Luxo claims they have no problems when it comes to artistic renditions of their iconic lamp. All this because Disney wanted to use a lamp as their opening credit scene and it just so happened to look like a lamp that already exists. And at number seven is Drive. Now this one is kind of a special exception to our list because it's actually the movie trailer that ended them with a lawsuit, which is a compilation of scenes, or just one really long one. In October 2011, a woman from Michigan named Sarah Deming filed a lawsuit against the Emma Jean Novi Movie Theater and Film District Distribution for making a misleading trailer. Apparently. In her claim, she wrote, The film distributor promoted Drive as very similar to the Fast and Furious or similar series of movies. She was upset that the movie was actually a methodical art film that didn't have much driving in it at all, let alone race car action. Sarah went after statutory damages under the Michigan's Consumer Protection Act and wanted the case certified as a class action lawsuit. The judge ended up siding with the defendants, thank God, and on October 15th, 2013, the court rejected her appeal. That is the dumbest thing I have. I've ever heard. Here we are number six with 12 Monkeys. The 1995 movie tells the story of a convict named James Cole who decides to volunteer for a mission. He has to travel back in time in order to learn about the reason behind a brutal holocaust. During one scene in the movie, actor Bruce Willis gets interrogated by this weird sphere object that somehow is able to examine his weaknesses. It was kind of cool and creepy at the same time, but apparently this device was already a thing and an architect named Lebius Woods thought it was similar to his neo-mechanical tower chamber piece, so he sued. And he sued Successfully. Universal Pictures had to pay him a hefty sum and also give credit to him in the film. Guaranteed the director wishes he could go back and replace the prop with literally any other shape or object. 
like anything else would have done. Coming into number four is Knowing. Nicolas Cage took on the lead role in the 2009 movie, which told the story of a teacher who comes across a time capsule that makes him believe he has the power to change the chain of events that are about to happen. In the movie, we get a look at a crazy piece of technology that can actually predict the locations of every natural disaster. Pretty cool. Right? But there's just one little problem, and that is that the time capsule already exists. Well, that type of technology. Turns out it's been in development by a tech company called Global Findability, and they call it Integrated Information Processing System for Geospatial Media. They ended up suing Summit Entertainment and filed a patent infringement against them. Their claim states that the Geospatial Entity Object Code was used in the film, which goes against their patent for use without permission. In our third spot is one that came from the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. The movie tells the real life story of Jordan Belfort, who was convicted of fraud after cheating his way up to the top in stockbroking. A former Stratton Oakman general counsel, Andrew Green, was personified in the movie as Nikki, aka Rugrat. After watching some of the scenes that his persona is portrayed, he sued Paramount Pictures saying they didn't have permission and that the portrayal has ruined his real life business. The movie is based on real events, but of course is dramatized. He particularly wasn't a big fan of the scene when his character is partying with prostitutes at a bachelor party with silver trays containing illegal drugs. The lawsuit was ongoing for four years until it finally came to resolution in 2018. The court ruled in Paramount's favor, saying that the character facts in the movie have a different name, nickname, employment history, personal history, and criminal history. They stated that no real person was portrayed or defamed. So Paramount took the win on this one. Cruise answer number two spot is the house scene in The Conjuring. All right, I'd probably be lying if I said just one house scene. It's definitely plural, seeing as basically the whole movie takes place in the house. For those of you who might not know, the movie is based on a true story of paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren, who investigated the real life haunting in the Perrin family house. But the house they filmed at still exists, and the people who currently live there have sued Warner Brothers over the movie. Gerald Helfrich and Norma Sutcliffe claim that since the release of the movie, people have been harassing them and vandalizing vandalizing their property. Unfortunately for them, they didn't get much success from their lawsuit, but they are still pleading their case in several online pieces. The movie scenes do show detailed hauntings of their house, and apparently people now know the layout of their home, and it's become an invasion of privacy and danger to them. But like, why did you let them film there then? Or if you knew that it was filmed there, why'd you move in? You know what I'm saying? Not saying it's your fault, but like, it's kind of your fault. Moving on to the number eight spot is a scene from Resident Evil, the final chapter. In the sixth and final movie of the series, we see Alice riding her motorcycle across the post apocalyptic zombie wasteland. And while filming the scene, the stunt woman named Olivia Jackson received life threatening injuries. While filming the stunt, her motorcycle collided with a camera crane, which had been lowered way too early. She was left in a medically induced coma for 17 days, and her injuries included crushed facial bones, severed neck artery, broken ribs, a disfigured face, torn fingers, nerve damage in her spinal cord, and the amputation of her whole left arm. For obvious reasons, she filed a lawsuit against the producers, including the director himself, Paul Anderson. She claimed that she was asked to do the stunt last minute with minimal preparation time and that they didn't have good weather that day. It was also reported that she was misformed about her medical coverage and that it didn't cover the majority of her injuries like they said that it would. The case has been ongoing since 2015, but recently it was revealed that she's having her medical costs fully covered, which was a total of $248,256. In the number seven spot is actually a few scenes from the horror movie Happy Death Day. Well, I don't think we can even call it a horror movie. I think it was supposed to be, but it turned out to be like a comedy in my opinion. And that's me being nice, because if you want the truth, the movie sucked, don't watch it. But that is not the point. The point is that Universal found themselves in a lawsuit for multiple scenes involving the masked killer. Fans started to share a side-by-side -side image of the masked killer, saying that it is the same design as King Cake Baby, the real mascot from the New Orleans Pelican School. The creator of the mascot, Jonathan Bertus, Sally sued Universal claiming they used the mascot without permission. Not only was he seeking half of the existing profits from the two current films, but he also wanted 50% of future proceeds. The lawsuit is still ongoing, but in the court of social media, it is a divided split. Some fans think the resemblance is uncanny, while others believe it's not close enough to the original. What do you guys think? Look at the picture and tell me in the comments. Sliding to number six is a scene from American Hustle that caused a whole lot of unnecessary drama. This has to be the most ridiculous one on our list today. A lawsuit came from a microwave. The movie received 10 Oscar nominations, but it was also handed a lawsuit due to a scene that focused on the use of a microwave. It's the scene when Rosalind tells her husband Irving that she reads an article by Paul Brodeur claiming 
saying that microwaves remove the nutrition from food. Brodeur is an actual science writer for the New Yorker, and he has in fact published books on the apparent dangers of microwave radiation. Yet for some reason, he sued the film's production team, saying that he never suggested that microwaves reduce the nutrition of the food and that they used a false claim to his work. He sued for $1 million in libel damages, saying that the false claim in the movie had tainted his reputation. But in the end, the lawsuit was dismissed because the court decided that Jennifer Lawrence's performance in that scene would not be taken seriously by anyone anyways. And they are probably right, because she was a riot. Happy to the list at number 5 is one from Avatar. The director of the wildly successful franchise, James Cameron, faced some heat after he brought us his vision using both his mind and technology. His vision skyrocketed to the top of the box office and became the second highest grossing movie of all time. But the real question is… Was it actually his vision? After the first scene, we saw that introduced us to the Pandora world, an artist came forward saying the movie copied some of his artwork. Roger Dean sued James Cameron for $50 million, claiming that in the Pandora design, he clearly copied key pieces from his art collection. The court agreed that the movie may have been influenced by his work, but they ended up ruling in Avatar's favor. Here we are number 4 with The Devil's Advocate. The famous 1997 movie starring Al Pacino has gone down in cinema history, but so did the lawsuit it had against the production team. It all came from a movie scene in which we see that Al Pacino's character has some human sculptures in his apartment. One important scene in the movie features them, so it's not like they were just lost in the background somewhere. An artist named Frederick Hart thought they were similar to the piece of his called Ex Nihilo. His piece was built in Washington DC's Episcopal National Cathedral, so he teamed up with the cathedral and they both sued Warner Brothers. They ended up coming to an agreement and Warner Brothers edited the offending scene for the home video release. They edited out the sculptures and put a sticker on the VHS copy saying that there is no relation to the artwork. 